everyone. Uh, for this next session, our speaker will talk about consistency and isolation for Python programmers. Let us all welcome Jesse Davis. To do this, you need to choose um, a solution for it, like serializable or read uncommitted. And if you use a distributed database like MongoDB, then you need a uh, consistency level, like eventually consistent or linearizable. There are dozens of options. And to make things worse, consistency and isolation are easy to confuse with each other, and people don't really use those terms very consistently. In all of computer science, I think that this is one of the most difficult subjects to learn. But it's important to learn this, because if we get it wrong, we could lose money or data or worse. When you start learning about consistency and isolation, it's easy to get lost in the weeds. So, what's the bottom line? We're going to start off with a simple world where your transactions run on one machine, one transaction at a time. But in the real world, of course, we're still going to say for now that your transactions run on one machine. We'll deal with distributed databases later in this talk. But in the real world, transactions run in parallel. And that can lead to different outcomes than if they were running one at a time. And these visible differences are called anomalies. An anomaly is when a client sees a phenomenon that reveals that the database is running transactions in parallel. This is my understanding of what an anomaly is. Uh, it's not defined in the SQL standard. The SQL standard just lists a bunch of things and says, these are anomalies. But my uh, understanding of what anomalies are in general is this one. Isolation and anomalies, it took me years to really learn this, but I have an idea for what we can do today to make this easier. We're going to build a database in Python. It's not the final frontier. People have gone here before, but uh, I think it's going to be helpful for understanding isolation. Here's how the database is going to work. It's going to be a Telnet server because Telnet is almost as old as Wi-Fi. And it's got two commands, get and set. When you get a key that doesn't exist, it says not found, you can set any key to any value, and then you can get it back. That's it. That's the whole database. So let's look at the code. It stores its data. This is not the whole code. It stores its data in memory in advance. And whenever a client uh, connects, the server starts a thread and processes commands. If the command is set, then you store the data in advance. And if it's a get, then you try to return the value or say not found. Now, obviously, this is just demo code. Uh, it has lots of problems. The only problems that we're going to focus on today are the anomalies. If two people use this database at the same time, what anomalies are they going to see? We'll start off with the lowest isolation level, read uncommitted, and let's see some anomalies. So let's say Kirk is down on the planet and McCoy wants to beam him up. So he updates the ship's computer. Um, first of all, Kirk's on planet is equal to 1, Enterprise 0. Scotty updates Kirk's on planet to 0, Kirk's on Enterprise 1. But McCoy, meanwhile, is wondering, where is Jim? So he checks the ship's computer. He gets Kirk's on planet 0, because that's Scotty's already updated that. And then he also gets Kirk's on Enterprise, and he sees 0 there, too, because Scotty hasn't updated that. This is an anomaly called a dirty beam. He is seeing data on a transaction that Scotty has not yet completed. 
we need a stronger isolation level to be able to hit this anomaly. So let's try the next level up called Read Committed. And the code's going to look like this. So we've got a dict of locks. It's a default dict, so it creates locks on demand. When a thread starts up, it creates an empty transaction that holds no locks. And then it's got a utility function called a par lock, which uh, gets or creates a lock for this key, locks it, and sticks it in the list. And then we've got the standard command loop. So if the command is set, then we acquire a lock to the rest of the transaction and add it to the list. And if the command is a get, then we just hold the lock briefly to check the dict and return the value to the user. And we've also got a new command, commit, which drops all the locks so that this transaction is less visible to other transactions. So let's run the story again with read committed. Scotty starts his transaction. McCoy gets cursed on planet, but now he blocks because Scotty is holding a lock on this key. Scotty finishes his transaction and commits. He drops his locks so that unblocks McCoy, so now he sees that Kirk's on planet is zero. McCoy finishes his transaction, and he sees that Kirk is on the enterprise. So there is no anomaly. This works in read committed, partly because Scotty and McCoy are accessing keys in the same order. So let's see what happens, though, if McCoy swaps the order of his reads. All right, same start, but McCoy checks Kirk's on Enterprise first. Scotty doesn't have a lock on this yet because he hasn't written to it, so McCoy is allowed to see that it's zero. Scotty then updates it, finishes his transaction, and McCoy finishes his. Once again, it's an anomaly, but it's a different one. It's called a read speed. McCoy is seeing data both from before and after after Scotty's transaction, which wouldn't be allowed if they were doing their transactions one at a time. So let's get in there and fix the problem. We need a stronger isolation level, like snapshot isolation. Um, this is going to be a lot of code. This is going to be the worst slide. All right, so let's just get through it together. Um, to start off, we need some more global state. Uh, and we'll see in a minute how all of this is used. When a server thread starts up, uh, it gets the lock. That lock uh, protects a global state like the DB. And this local transaction makes a copy of all of the data into a global snapshot. It also makes an empty list of writes to this transaction. It sets its start time as the current timestamp and increments the global timestamp. All right. We start the command loop. If there is a set, we don't affect global state. We only update the local snapshot, and we record the fact that we've written this key. If it's a get, we also don't touch global state. We read from the local snapshot. And then commit, this is the complicated part. Uh, all right, so we lock the global state, and we choose a commit time, which is larger than any timestamp used so far for either a start or a commit time for another transaction. And then we check, has any other transaction written the same keys that we want to write while this transaction's been running? And the specific way to do that is by checking, has any key in the global state, does it have a write time between our start time and our commit time? Uh, so, then we abort this transaction. Otherwise, we can commit, and we do that by updating the global write times with our commit time and copying all of the writes into the global database. And finally, whether we committed or aborted, we reset the local state with a new snapshot and a new start time. Whew. All right, that was the worst. Um, a real database would do clever copy on write stuff so it doesn't have to copy the entire contents of the database. 
a 70% surgery. We don't need to worry about that kind of thing. What we're here for is to understand what snapshot isolation means, and I think this is useful for that. So how does this story go under snapshot isolation? Scotty starts his transaction. McCoy reads Crooks on Enterprise from his snapshot. Scotty finishes his transaction. McCoy reads Crooks on Planet, and he sees one even though Scotty set it to zero. That's what snapshot isolation means. It means that you're reading from a consistent snapshot of the data in the past. So it could be stale, but there's no read skew. Snapshot isolation has a few anomalies that it still allows. Uh, let's look at that. So new story, new characters. It's time for some shore leave but there's only one shuttle in the shuttle bay. Sulu and Uhura, they both want it. So Sulu checks whether Uhura has claimed it. No, she hasn't. Uhura checks if Sulu has. Sulu then claims the shuttle, and so does Uhura. Sulu commits and thinks he has claimed the shuttle, and so does Uhura. This is an anomaly called right skew. Uh, you can see how this couldn't happen if the transactions were happening one at a time. But snapshot isolation allows this anomaly. To prohibit right skew, we're going to need an even stronger isolation level like serializable, which is one of the strongest. This code is going to be almost the same as the previous is isolation level we had committed. So it's much simpler again. We have a dict of locks. We start off with an empty list of locks for this transaction. We've got the same utility function, which gets or creates a lock for a key, locks it, adds it to the list. Uh, the set command is the same as for read committed, where we just lock the key for the rest of the transaction. The get command, this is where this is different from the read committed implementation. With read committed, we only locked that key briefly to return it to the client. With serializable isolation, we're actually locking this key for the rest of the transaction, even for a get. And we, uh, we lock it to make sure that no other transaction is allowed to modify this value until this transaction finishes. And that includes, even if the key doesn't exist, no other transaction is allowed to create it. Uh, if it did, that would be called a phantom. So this lock prevents phantoms. And then the commit command is the same as for read committed, where we just drop all the locks. So how does the story go under serializability? Sulu checks if Uhura has the shuttle. Uhura checks if Sulu does. Sulu tries to update Sulu has shuttle, and he blocks because Uhura has that key blocked. And the same happens to Uhura. So now we have something called a deadlock, which serializability is prone to. Um, Kirk would probably have to come in and arbitrate this conflict. Uh, in real databases, there are deadlock detection algorithms, which abort at least one of these transactions to free the deadlock. Um, Despite the deadlock that I showed you, serializability is actually a great isolation level. Um, it means that transactions appear to have happened atomically in some total order. It might not be the actual order that you did the operations or committed the transactions, um, but it's as if the transactions happened one at a time in some total order, and that order appears to be the same to all of the clients. These four isolation levels are in order of increasing strength from uh, the bottom, where there's more parallelism, to the top, where there are fewer anomalies. The higher you go, generally the slower you get and the less parallelism is possible. Um, take your pick. You have to think about what your application actually needs, and when in doubt, choose the strongest. 
Okay, so we've been talking about isolation this whole time, and I also promised that we would talk about consistency. These are easy to confuse with each other, and people don't always use these terms consistently. So, isolation. It prohibits anomalies in transactions of multiple items on one machine due to concurrency. The new concept that we're going to talk about now is consistency, which prohibits anomalies in transactions on single data objects on a cluster of machines due to distributed execution. So a distributed database, it's deployed on a cluster of machines. You send an update to one of those machines. Um, some kinds of databases, there's a one meter on our you can send the update to any machine. Regardless, that update has to be eventually replicated to some or all of the other machines. And then you can read the data either just from the meter or from any machine that has a copy of the data. Again, it depends. The important thing for us right now is replication. It's slow. There's a lag between the update being received and reaching all of the other machines. And when this lag is visible, that's an anomaly. So an anomaly, the distributed database version, is when a client sees a phenomenon that reveals the machine, it, the database is distributed, not single machine. And again, this is my understanding of what this term means. Eventual consistency is the weakest consistency level. Uh, let's tell a new story. So McCoy is on the surface. He makes a tricorder reading, and he uploads it to one of the machines. That applies the update, replicates it to one of the machines, but the other machine, the one at the top, is laggy. It hasn't replicated yet. McCoy sends a message saying, I've uploaded the tricorder data, and that is also replicated. And then Uhura checks her inbox. She sees McCoy's message saying, I've uploaded the data, so she fetches the data. And it happens that she sends that request to the laggy machine. This is common in distributed databases that clients can randomly load balance or randomly choose various machines. Um, and this is one of the sources of anomalies, which is that, in this case, the tricorder data isn't there. And this anomaly is called the causal violation. We'll define causal in a second. So, uh, Uhura has again seen an anomaly, so we need a stronger consistency level. Let's choose causal consistency. With causal consistency, all clients observe causally related operations in the same order. McCoy's two operations are causally related. He first uploaded the data, and then because he did that, he then updated a message uh, saying that he had done so. In causal consistency, um, Uhura, if she sees operation two, she must also be able to see operation one. Somebody else could be doing causally unrelated operations, and Uhura could see those before or after she sees McCoy's. Um, this is not a total order. Any of those is possible. A common way to implement causal consistency is to have a timestamp on every server. It's not an actual clock time, it's just a number. In this case, they all start with t equals zero. So McCoy uploads his data, and his local machine implements its timestamp. That's replicated to another machine, which also implements its timestamp. The laggy machine still has t equals zero. Now McCoy uploads his message. His local machine updates its timestamp, and the replicated machine also updates its timestamp. Now, Uhura checks her inbox, and she gets McCoy's message, but she also gets the latest timestamp from the server she talked to, which is two. So now, when she gets the tricorder data, she asks for data that's 
uh, at least as recent as timestamp two. So that means she has to wait because this server hasn't reached timestamp two yet. Eventually it replicates and gives the correct answer, so there's no anomaly. So causal consistency is a great consistency level, but it allows a lot of anomalies still. So we might want a stronger consistency level called linearizability. Linearizability means that each operation happens atomically between when the client sends a request and about the reply and all clients see the same total order of operations. Um, when I say atomically, I mean that the operation seems to happen at some instant between the time that you sent it and got the reply. So nobody ever sees partial operations. Um, notice that in linearizability, unlike serializability, the system has to do the operations in approximately the order that the clients sent them. Implementing linearizability, I'm not going to be able to show you the implementation. It's complicated. Um, people often use consensus algorithms like uh, Paxos or Raft to implement this. Um, usually there is a uh, one reader machine at a time that clients have to send all of their operations to. The reader then does some sort of coordination maverick, like maybe Paxos or Raft to guarantee that this data is available to anybody who asks for it. Once that coordination magic is complete, then the leader acknowledges to the client that it's done. Linearizability is particularly useful if you've got some out of band communications that don't go through the database. So here, let's say McCoy flips open his communicator and he calls you her directly and says, Lieutenant Uhura, I've updated the data. Linearizability guarantees that Uhura can then ask the leader for this data and it will be available and there won't be any anomaly that the uh, order of operations within the database is um, roughly what people expect based on their real world order of things that they do. With all of these consistency levels, their guarantees hold even if the machine dies. So with linearizability, let's say that the leader dies and some other leader takes over. It is guaranteed that this leader has the data if it were asked for it, so it can give her the correct answer. So putting it all together, on the left, we have isolation levels for transactions on single machines. And on the right, we have consistency levels for distributed databases. Uh, if you want to prohibit all of the anomalies that we saw in a distributed database, then you want strict serializability, which is the slowest of these levels. And uh, the system is the most likely to go unavailable to refuse to respond to you if um, it can't make these guarantees but it will pretty much do what you expect under all circumstances. You don't have to memorize this chart or anything that I said today. Uh, there's lots of things that you can read. The link here will uh, include links to the code that I showed you and lots of things that you can read about consistency and isolation. I'm not going to take questions up here, um, but I'm going to be at the hall in a minute if you want to talk. Thanks very much.